Dave asked me to say a few words here about universal health care. Um, I told him I had very little to bring to, to, to this debate, and he told me that's exactly why he was speaking. Um, he wanted someone who knew absolutely nothing about the topic, and that I could stand as a sort of forerunner for two fine speakers following after, and they could answer all the questions. Um, when I heard about universal health care when I started looking at it, that was the first picture when you Google universal health care. The first picture under images comes up. And having looked at it for many hours, I could understand exactly why they're all asleep. I suppose we all hear about universal health care, and it's been in the media in Ireland now for um, a number of years, but particularly since Fine Gael have come into power. Um, everyone seems to be talking about it. So I presumed I was actually ignorant and that I actually didn't know what it was until I actually went and looked it up. Again, Google, it's a great communication tool. But there's huge definitions out there of what universal healthcare is. And very few people actually agree what it is. It depends on what country you're in, it depends on what agenda you have, and it depends on what side of the camp. But basically the most common definition is it's a, it can be defined as equal care for every person based upon medical need rather than financial means. Now that seems fantastic, but the devil then becomes the detail. And when you actually go into each of the health authorities and look at what they're proposing, there's various aspects. Universal health care, it's not a one size fits all model. And nor does it imply coverage for all people for everything. And that's where the detail comes into it. And that's where different countries have different problems. And that's where GPs have a right to be worried and GPs have a right to speak out. Because if we don't speak out, we're here to look after our patients. We're advocates for our patients. And sometimes that gets forgotten in the whole macroeconomic debate. Um, very interesting to hear the standards discussion earlier on. Um, it takes a while for patient care to come into it and caring for patients as opposed to uh, methodologies for measuring whether someone is looked after or not. Um, and universal health care is the same. There are different camps and there's different agendas. And I think it's very important for primary care to realise that they have a duty and an agenda as well. Universal health care, it can be determined by three critical dimensions. Who is covered, what services are covered, and how much of the cost is covered. And you can, you can see all of a sudden there's room for a huge debate and arguing as regards what the model will be produced in Ireland. Then the funding models, when you look at it, and there's mixed models, and there was various phrases when you, that you'd hear in the media band, bandied about, compulsory insurance, tax-based findings, social health insurance, private insurance, single-payer, community-based health insurance. They're all phrases. They're all phrases of who's ultimately going to pay. And it, it reminds me of, of a, a game that you play with your children at home, musical chairs, when the music stops, who's left standing? Who's left holding the bill? It seems to be basically that people will, hold the, will, will pay the bill in the end, and it's a different model of how they're going to pay. The Irish debate sort of took on over the last couple of years, and there's been a few, there's been many documents about it, but sort of three of the, the, the documents that I think are worth mentioning are, first of all, the fair care policy developed by the minister. Now, when you look at the fair care policy in, in, in the small print, it was developed with Fergus of Real as a result of a health commission which was chaired by Alan Dukes. Now, um, Alan Dukes, as you all know, is, is one of the chairmen of the banks at the moment, so that really reassured me that uh, uh, this was going in a, in a, in a good place. Um, the other document that was produced was the Adelaide Hospital Society produced a document on universal health insurance. And I think it would be fair to say it wasn't exactly what you'd call pro-GP in its, its outlook. The other document that I think you need to look at when you're talking about universal health insurance is a, is a position statement outlined by the IMO. And I may be biased, but I think it's a fantastic document when you actually look at what they're hoping to achieve. And this would be what you'd call nirvana if you were looking for a universal health model. This cartoon I saw, I think this is the Michael O'Leary uh, model of universal health care just in case you can't see it, the cut costs, we've moved the clinic to China. Um, no doubt Michael O'Leary's planes would land in Germany and we'd bus to China to get our orthopaedic review. So the perfect system, as outlined, you know, looking at a model for universal health insurance, 
It has loads of abilities and efficiencies and autonomies, but basically access to adequate healthcare for all, services that are free at the point of access, equity of access, and then there's solidarity, transparency, quality of care, and the more of those headings you have, the more it costs the population, basically, and the more you have to resource the, 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 the model. The issues, I think, just looking through it and looking at it, and again, this is so, coming from a GP working in the system rather than coming from a, an economic model, is who pays for it and how does it work? And that's what the debate is about. Now, the Minister has set up an expert group that's looking at this in Ireland, and I look through the members, and, and I find it staggering to know that there's no GP on it. There's no member of the primary care community on this. There's four doctors, all of whom I presume are economists, but there's no GP on it. And considering primary care are responsible for 90% of the consultations, I think it's staggering that we're not involved in looking at a model of universal health insurance. Which model is the one um, that we're going to look at? Everyone is talking about the Dutch model. Um, I just read in the newspaper yesterday that the Dutch model seems to be 2.8 billion in debt on a yearly basis. I'm not sure how accurate that figure is, but our next speaker, Johan, will be able to fill us in more, I'm sure. And the third issue that comes into this competition law, and again, the, how does competition law come into it? There's a number of issues about it. And this all, I'm sure, will fill us in on, on the, the solutions to all the, these questions. But these were a few of my questions I had, having read through it, that the role of the insurers in this. So I'll, I'll take an insurance company like VHI. Um, to me, and again, I, I'm not a legal expert, but it looked to be that they were involved in anti-competitive behaviour for a number of reasons, in that they're the procurer of services and they're the provider of services. So they're actually um, paying people to do services and they're also in competition for the services. And I would say that would be an antitrust, as they say in the United States, that certainly you, would have a, uh, you could possibly have a legal case against them. I would also think the insurers are limiting services to certain groups. So I would take, say, women of the country, um, when you're, the marina coil is an example of a minor surgical procedure that can be carried out safely in general practice, but general practitioners are not covered to put in the marina coil, patients have to pay for it, whereas they can go to hospital and get it done at an extraordinary cost to, 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 to someone, to the taxpayer, and yet when GPs try and get this done, they're told, no, we don't deal with GPs in relation to this. Um, the other thing I think we need to look at is the insurance and the balance of profit and service. So when universal health insurance does come in, um, the state will pay X insurer a certain amount of money for certain procedures, but the devil will be in the detail. So you'll find GPs having to look up um, whether their heart procedure is actually covered under section 2AB 49C or that the patient will have the procedure done and then they'll be billed for the extra amount. I think the future negotiations of this are vital and looking at the competition law in relation to the government being allowed to um, negotiate I think is also something that we need to look at. Uh, you'll all be aware of the, the, the ruling a number of years ago that stopped uh, the government negotiating with uh, bodies. Now there's a huge debate about this and the Attorney General uh, at the time, Paul Gallagher, has given information recently that he feels that, uh, that the competi competition authority were incorrect in their looking at that and that it should be looked at again. And I think that's something I'd like as well to maybe mention or talk about later on. So there are just a few of the issues that I think we need to look at. I think they're serious issues. I think as GPs, because we're patients advocates, if we don't get involved, and there is a danger, as someone was saying earlier, we're, we're busy enough without having to get involved in this sort of political activity, but we could find ourselves isolated very much that the one service that's actually working in the healthcare system, we're not being included in negotiations, we're not being asked our opinion, and we're being given uh, what our health criteria that are for the better of our patients, yet we've been doing this job for a couple of hundred years in this country and our stats are fairly good. 
So I'd like to hand you over back to Lona. Thanks very much.